Hi there, and welcome to the second episode of Industry Town. Today's guest is someone who makes triple threats look real lazy. Liam McKendrick had a record deal by the end of college, a fully produced musical web series back in 2013, acting credits in television and studio films. She's a prolific producer of award-winning short films and a screenwriter who got her first movie, MFA, made. And not just made, this movie premiered at South By, had a theatrical release, is now on Amazon Prime, and has opened up a whole new part of her career as an in-demand screenwriter working on multiple studio projects. We met in class but became much better friends working on her short film, Girl in the Green Dress. Leah is a wealth of information, and she's going to talk about making content, the jump from short films to features, the role of an entrepreneurial spirit in making a career happen, and why her parents are terrified of Hollywood and Vine. Here we go. Lock it up. Very quiet and still. Ready. Scene one, take three, A mark. And we are live. Woo! Leah McKendrick. Hello. Welcome to Industry Town. Industry Town, is that what it's called? That's what it's called. That's, That's pretty dope. Well, the idea, I think, is that I want it to be a place that people feel like they're going. Mm. And I've always thought that when people talk about DC and LA as being one industry towns, that was always kind of sexy to me. Oh, I always thought that, that sounded kind of neat. Sexy. Yeah. Right? Like, oh man, I want to be in that thing. I want to be I want to be a part of that. Right. And what it happens al- in DC? Porn? Oh no. Well, oh, right. politics. Oh, is that? Yeah, what that's is, the one. What's over there? Okay. And, well, I guess porn's involved. <laughs> D- debatable. No, yeah. Porn. It's Van Nuys. <laughs> We can have that conversation too. Like DC, Trump, what's happening over there? But also, I I like the idea that that means it's not just actors, right? You know, this could be an agent, it could be a PR yeah, person, it could yeah, be writers, yeah, totally. it could be Instagram influencers. It's people who are in this town, people who are yeah. in the entertainment industry. Cool. Um, so I want to start with. I was actually in Idlewild two yes, weekends ago. That's our town. That is our town with the tree people. <laughs> the tree people. Um, <laughs> no, and I got to go there and I was showing uh, Kara around and my dad and showing the the theater Are and all that fun stuff. You know, th- that's why we were there. He's renting a house there right no now. No way. Because of you? Because of us? Sadly, no. No, it's because <laughs> Palm Springs is fucking too hot for so hot. men yeah. in their late 60s to oh, yeah, just stay there the him. whole time if they don't have to. Yeah, no. Um, but it did get me thinking about Girl in the Green Dress. Yeah. Which was a really awesome experience for so many reasons, including that it eventually led to you introducing me to my wife. So Isn't thank you. So nuts. I can't believe that. Yeah. If anybody's looking for a matchmaker, what's <laughs> what, what, what's the what's the what's uh, what's your Instagram so they can DM you and ask for <laughs> right. advice? Hit me up. Um, no, but I wanted to know. Um, so when you were producing that and starring in that, did you know that that was going to be a long road for you of content creation? Was this always the direction that I'm going to eventually be making my own movies, that I'm going to be on both sides of the camera? Was that the idea or was this a way to make yourself be seen as an actress? No, that was already that was already in the works. My My first big thing was actually pre-Brian Norris <gasps> and it was in the Kara days what? when I made a musical web series Destroy the Alpha Gammas and that was a hundred percent a vehicle for my acting and my singing and my my life as, a, as an entertainer because you started as a singer right yes well yeah I mean I grew up in musical theater and so I always wanted to do, act and sing and dance I always wanted to do it all but I got a record deal right after um, co- I studied acting in college at Chapman and then I but I was always like in LA on the weekends and at night too like showcasing I was really like not invested in school because I just didn't want to be there my parents made me go to college and I was like I want to be Britney Spears actually like, <laughs> I want to be me. half naked on stage <laughs> and my parents are like that is terrifying it's not a goal that we want to hear don't <laughs> share that one and I had been doing it since I was young which was funny that like I would get on these stages, even like my talent shows in high school, I would have like dancers. I was very like, I'm so surprised that I didn't get my ass beat. That like <laughs> nobody tried to like, you know, bully me. People were very like lovely to me. Um, and then I, you know, I wanted to be a pop singer. And so I got the record deal finally after school. And I had invested by, by the end of, of college. And I, and I love Chapman because they let me sort of like fly free. I would like write and direct and I would star in some stuff and I would write for other people and my professor professor used to try to make us shoot these scenes for our acting and film class that were like so dated it'd be like oh Dee, Dee you're so bombed and I'd be like no, no thank I'm you. not saying that what does that even mean I don't know how to <laughs> is make that, that high is that me. drunk like I don't even know what they're saying so I was like I'm not shooting this JB is my professor and he was like you're shooting it and I was like no I don't want to and he's like if you write something 
that's better, I'll let you shoot it. If it sucks, you're not shooting it. I was like, I can do that. So I started writing for my class, and then I started writing for other people's scenes, and then I like wrote a play, and I put that up, and then I was like wanting the theater, and they're like, you can't have the theater, and I was like, fine, I'll put it up on the steps at midnight, and then the, you know, the neighbors are complaining, I'm in the dean's office. I mean, it was like I was just constantly creating, and I was very experimental, and it was coming from a place of just frustration that I had to be in school and having so many ideas but not necessarily um, you know living in the real world yet and so right as soon as I graduated I not long after I got a record deal and was off to the races with that and then the label folded which completely destroyed me and put me on it was like a kind of dark place and I was like depressed and really didn't know what to do and sort of in a probably in a place of like denial so I was like oh well probably what's going to happen is my label's going to like get acquired by a bigger label a different major and then I'll have to showcase again so I should just like put together my stage show because they're going to need me to do that soon so then I'm like performing all over like the Viper Room and the Troubadour and everybody was like you should be on Glee because you act and you sing and you dance you should be on Glee so I was like okay I'll just like go be on Glee now and like I could not <laughs> excuse get me it. UDK I'm supposed UDK. to be on Glee they said Ryan I should Murphy? be on Glee hello <laughs> I'm here I've I'm arrived. here guys I'm going to be on Glee now could not get in for Glee it was like the hottest show. You remember how big it was. Oh, yeah. Remember that shit? And it was like Gwyneth Paltrow was on Glee at the time. Could not get in. Didn't have the reps for that. And so I was so frustrated. I had just done this weekly burlesque show that was where I met your wife, Kara. And we, me and Kara had the best time, even though it was kind of a shit show. And like we would be l- literally rehearsing and learning moves like an hour before the show. that Because every week was different. And we would have like Mariah Carey night. And we're like, please don't do this to us. <laughs> like, please. <laughs> we're begging you. Do not make us sing Mariah Carey. And me and Kara would just like be taking shots backstage. Like we were about to like cry or like get on stage so we might as well just like take a shot and we had the best time and so from there I thought to myself I know a lot of chicks that can act and sing and dance like I can and I know people with houses that's what I've got working for me what else okay like I was in the music industry so I know producers and I know choreographers how about I just like make my own glee So I created this series, Destroy the Alpha Gammas, that was about sororities at war, and I cast all my friends. And Where'd you get the money for it? Honestly, it began with a friend of mine. She had a little bit of money, and we thought it was going to be made for like five grand. Like We thought it was going to be this, can you believe this, seven Mm. episodes. It was like an hour long. We're like, oh, five grand, that'll cover it. Like, we're so inexperienced, right? Yep. We don't know what we're doing. Beautifully inexperienced, though. <laughs> There's something so sweet about that. It's so sweet, We got right? 5000 That's a lot of money, right? <laughs> right? When you're like 20, how old are we? Like 23, whatever, 24? We're like, none of us have that kind of money. So, like, that seems that like it'll totally cover it. That kind of four-figure money? Oh, shit. <laughs> right? Go to the That's club like, with that. Right? That's like more than five months rent. Like, that is big bucks. So, uh, but she had that money and she was like, I will pay for it. And we were like, dope. And then from there, it started growing and growing. But everybody was working for free. Like, that was like pretty much covering like the food. And we actually did end up renting a real sorority house at UCLA that had lost its what is it called when you you lose your like oh. right to be a sorority? Yeah, their sorority license There's, like, or term. something. They lost like their license essentially, yeah. right? So it was like all these international students and these like sorority girls that kind of got screwed. So it was like the owner of it was like, sure, you can shoot here for you know two weeks or whatever it was, and we shot the series and it grew to be way more than five grand. And from there, my boyfriend at the time picked up the tab. Well, which was like him really sort of backing me up and believing in me. And I mean, he was in the industry. So, I was. mean, it's also not just like, oh, I'm a doctor, have some of my money. Like, that's, he saw what you were doing. He saw right. that there's a real production here. Sure. He saw that there, like, this could be successful. Yeah. And then yeah. it all goes from there. And he was on the following at the time. He was writing and um, producing the following. So he wasn't like, you know, you know, we weren't getting kicked out of. His <laughs> and also on top of that, of if you're working on the following, my guess is that a little bit of something Glee-esque in your life is a real like palate cleanser. For sure. And I think he 
saw how hard we had worked to put together and how many people, you would show up to set, there was like 60 people. It was like so many people were there working for free. And this was like my dream and I had worked really hard and I was very much in over my head. And I think that at no point was he just like, I got to save the day. He was just like, I'll pay for that. I'll pay for that. I'll pay for that. And then before you knew it, he had like racked up this bill. And he, he to this day is like my one of my greatest champions of my work and in my life. And um, recogni- was the person that was like, you should be writing this. And I was like, I don't know how to write a screenplay. Like I have written stuff, but it's so, um, I don't, I didn't do it on final draft. I think I just did it like, you know, like on Word or whatever. And he was like, I'll get you the, the program and you'll figure it out. And I was like, no, help me. He's like, you're going to figure it out. So how'd you figure it out? I, I think I just, my first few scripts were really shitty. <laughs> like they really just did, weren't formatted correctly. And I think the more scripts you read, the So there's easier. like the technical element of it. Yes. Of, was that the area where you felt like you needed to learn? Yes. That I didn't really, but but also I I think that I always had like delusional self confidence in my storytelling abilities, and so I was like, oh, I know how to tell a story. I'm an actor. I know how to do that part. I know what an actor. I know what this character would say. I know what that character would say. Is that something intuitive to you? Yeah, I think it is for most actors. Like, you don't feel like you need to create like a eight page Bible for this character Never. to figure out where they talk or no anything way. like that. No, you just throw down. Yes, I think we all are experts in different kinds of people because we our whole lives have met and spent time with and gotten close to our parents, our siblings, our friends, people that we met in line at the coffee shop, people at the airport, our our single serving friends that we sat next to on the flight to New York. You know, I think we all, just the way that they say that we are all experts in good and bad acting because we know how I've normal it. people behave. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing, I believe, with how how characters are formed. You know, this person reminds me of my accountant or that neighbor I had growing up. So I've never been that kind. I mean, and then I, uh, look, I respect those types of writers that create these, like, huge backstories and whatever. And for me, it can just be, like, a single idea. I'm like... Um, one of my characters right now that I'm working on in one of my scripts is like the white guy super feminist who like doesn't realize that he's like a white guy and like thinks he's like Roxanne Gay and like wears the like smash the patriarchy shirts and like you know what I mean like that tank top that says this is what a feminist looks like yes exactly I'm not gonna lie I still kind of want one of those (laughs) I'm gonna get you one Brian thank you thank you thank you (laughs) Um, but isn't that isn't that what people really mean by write what you know like it's you don't don't write your life story in fact Mm -hmm. please don't write your life story because then all of a sudden there's your protagonist is going to watch everything and not do anything. (laughs) But this like, I know how these people talk. I know this type of world. I know. And like start from there rather than starting. Otherwise you're going to look at a blank screen and just think, what the fuck am I supposed to put on here? Right. When you're writing, um, do you jump straight into slug line exterior? Let's go. Are you right? Do you have note cards? Are you writing an outline? Are you writing a full treatment? Like where do you start? I'm not very organized. I'm the interior. <laughs> Let her rip. House. Yeah, night. I just kind of, and usually it comes from a single idea, right? Like, and sometimes it's a character. Usually it's just a single idea. Um, and from there, I start envisioning scenes or lines. And so I'm like itching to get to my computer to just put down what I have in my head, even if it sucks. I can delete it later or fix it later, but I, it'll leave me. Now, will that be an entire scene or will it be like a line of dialogue? It'll usually image? be a scene. So I will, I have like a note section as we all do in our phones and I will write that line. If I come up with like a funny line, I'll put that in my notes. Um, but if sometimes it's like, a, it's, it's like the cold open, you know, and I'll write that whole thing and it's just flowing out of me because I have it so clearly in my head and I've had it where I just didn't write it down and then I, I was like, yeah, that's not as good as I remembered it. And I get mad because I go, it might have been if I had actually just sat down and and done it when I was hot for it, you know? I've heard some stand-ups say that sometimes the difference between a successful one and someone who never actually does it is just actually writing down your material when it comes to you. Sure. Like that's, it's a habit. that's the difference is to make that a habit. Right. Do you subscribe to that? I see that. I so see that. So uh, let's go backwards with you for a second. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. That was a really long story about I my web series. I love that story. <laughs> no, no judge. It was uh, really long. Uh, no, but I want to know ever since I first met you, there has always been this kind of like, oh, I'm just going to do it. Yeah. 
like and no i hope never i'm hoping i'm gonna do it i'm planning i'm gonna do it i have this idea that i might do none of that sure. it almost just seems like you went to the future you saw that it all worked out you came <laughs> back and you're like no i got it oh my god that's so kind i don't see myself as that but it's, there's a there's an underlying confidence though and i'm wondering were you born that way like is that something like <laughs> were there stories about you as like a three-year-old being like no i'm gonna walk around the yeah. block buy an ice cream cone and come back and no one's gonna stop me yeah so that's just you. <laughs> you know, it's funny because my mom, yes, yeah, she talks about me walking in when I was two years old to pick my brother up from um, preschool. So my brother's four. He's two years older than me. And I would be like strutting in. I'd be like, good morning, Mrs. Bound, because I couldn't say Mrs. Brown. And I would just like, my mom was like, there she goes, walking like she owns the place. She's two years old. Like, I can't control her. And I, and I do think that there's an, an element of just... And it's, this is kind of like a depressing, sad thing to say, but I don't think of it that way. But I do, my mom will cry sometimes because she, she, we've gotten into arguments and she'll be like, you were never a child. You were never a child. You never let me comb oh. your hair. You never let you, me be your mother. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't even know what to say to that. But there is an element of she's always been right. I never wanted to be a kid. I always wanted to be in this business. I was dying to leave San Francisco. I was I was always producing since I was a kid. I was like hiring dancers and spending my allowance on like making costumes and writing and songwriting and um, creating just constantly and just f coming at from a place of like pure frustration, never feeling like enough was happening and always feeling artistic and feeling that I had a lot to say, even when I was 13 years old and, and didn't probably, <laughs> had very yeah. little to say about anything. Um, I read so many magazines. I was very fascinated by women and girls and the human experience. And um, so I do think that it, it wasn't confidence so much as just frustration of, of I have so much to do and feeling that if you believe in past lives, that in a past life, I must have failed at this because I was raring to go from the beginning and I feel behind. And I feel sad about that sometimes because I think it is one of my great flaws is that I'm never satisfied and I'm never totally proud of myself because I feel that I, I have so much lost time to make up for. I should have been here five years ago. I should have done that five years ago and always feeling that I've never done enough. There's a lot to unpack there. I know. Um, <laughs> let me start with one of the, what, what do your parents do for a living? My dad's a real estate broker mm -hmm. and my mom is, she doesn't practice anymore, but she was a psychotherapist. So do you think both of them are kind of uh, manifestors? Like whatever we kind of need to do is just going to happen. Self-starters uh, who kind oh. of don't see limitations or are you, are you the weirdo in your family for that? We're all kind of weirdos. My, my dad started the first real estate newspaper in San Francisco. I mean, he, uh, he is such a self-starter. And, like, God has never went to college, grew up very poor on a hippie commune, and got his real estate license, was, was practicing and selling real estate at 18, in the phone book, calling up houses to see if they ever thought of selling. And then realize that all of the outside towns outside of San Francisco and the Bay Area had real estate newspapers and San Francisco didn't so he started it and then by the time he was like 25 or something really young it was acquired by like a big company he took that money um he sold it took that money and just bought up they, my cousins call him the slum lord because he would buy all these <laughs> buildings <laughs> in the hood <laughs> so he bought all these like really like trashy buildings but then he became a real estate investor and from that you know San Francisco is it's the right place to be buying. It's the right place to have bought in the in the you know the eighties or whatever it was. And um, but now he's so not that way. He's so conservative about investments. And my whole life, so scared for me as an actress, and like so sure that I'm giving blowjobs on Hollywood and Vine. Like so terrified for me, right? And I'm like, I hear these stories of when my dad was young and he was like this like go getter, and I'm like. I so don't see that in my dad now. I like love to hear that he used to be that way. Do you have any memories of him like that? I mean, he's always gotten up at 4 a.m. And, and gone to work at 4 a.m. And he's always been his own boss. But he's such a workaholic that I never felt like I'm, I'm like, I'm an artist, you know. So I don't think I've ever rela related to my dad in that way. And my mom being a therapist was so scared for me always living in this life that, that – 
so many people are damaged by in this business and um, I, they never wanted this for me, but my mom, I think, has always known that I was an artist, and she saw it very young. When I my grandma died when I was two, she was like my little BFF. My mom said that I sang all the time. Like she would catch me alone in the my room or in the garden, and I was just singing, singing, singing. And she saw that that was self soothing, and that was sort of how I communicated my own pain. So she knew pretty quickly, like Olia oh, is an artist. I feel like it's really hard for people who didn't see some kind of self-starting entrepreneurship from their parents modeled for them Mm. to find that. And Mm -hmm. every artistic business is some form of that. I guess like maybe if you're like professionally going from like chorus to chorus of Broadway shows, you can kind of see yourself as more of an employee. Mm. But I think for most of it, there's some like look at me or I like, and, and that that's okay. Or that, uh, I don't have to answer to anybody for my career or that the way to make money or to find your happiness, it does not involve clocking in anyway. That's true. I mean, I guess I never thought of it that way, Brian. I mean, I, I, yeah, my mom also was her own boss in a lot of ways, being a therapist with her clients and, and we would go on, we would spend the entire summer in Nicaragua where my mom is from. So, um, it seems like you have a lot of the ingredients for someone to be yeah, a really great so. artist because your your both parents. I'll start with your dad. Like has this. I'm gonna I'm gonna make my own thing happen for me. I'm gonna wake up at four a.m. I'm gonna create this thing that no one has said they want yet. Right, you know, the magazine true. didn't exist. Yeah. Um, your mother doesn't sound like was working as part of a larger group. She yeah. Was no, she on her own. Her own. She practice. did her do her own. She kind of and that was the interesting thing. She would quit places if she didn't feel that she was being useful enough to the community and my mom is bilingual and an immigrant so she was constantly like that's not good enough moving on so then we also have uh high expectations for ourselves and what our work does sure psychotherapists are by nature very curious about the interior so you're going to be asking a lot of questions yeah and we're also adding that you're going to nicaragua which travel i think leads to empathy and leads to Definitely. curiosity about other people and oh, it yeah. seems like you kind of had the martini mix like just Funny. shake it up yeah. and like you're gonna get a creative person it's not necessarily gonna work out for everybody with that but it feels like those are really good ingredients and i think you can't necessarily control what your parents do right. but if you didn't grow up with that if you didn't have that modeled you can start saying well those are the types of things i need to be looking for those people in my life i need to be listening to podcasts or or, or books about self-starting and entrepreneurship and 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 really kind of trying to take that on because right. so many people you know they have their agent and the way they talk about it is like they work for their agent oh interesting. but it's like oh god i hope some agent hires me to be their actor right and, right and then they're scared when the phone call comes in and there's no agency over what their headshots look like what their demo looks right. like and it really feels like well when they get me an audition then it's my turn to clock in to work mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and it, i think that's a really tough thing to to actually get on a cellular level of like no if you want to be an artist you're the ceo of that company and you're the one who's going to make it happen or not right yeah i mean i guess i that's so true i didn't you know it's so funny because we from my perspective, I was like, yeah, I was pretty like screwed with the parents that I got because <laughs> I have these other, like I dated this guy in college and his parents would come out from Missouri and he would be in a show and they would literally go to Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, matinee on Sunday. And I was like, my parents see me one time and then they're at Disneyland. Like yeah. They're at Disneyland for the rest of the trip. Like they're like, good job, Leah. <laughs> then they're out. Or like the guy that I'm dating now, he did a short film and like sent it to his dad and his dad was like, this is so incredible. Like, you got to show it to your mom. I was like, I have never in my life sent my parents, like, what I do. So I think in a weird way, I've like, oh, that's like other people got parents that are like really proud of them and like really get what they do. I don't get that. That's okay. Because I knew that I was never going to be homeless because my parents would always provide for me in that way. But I guess you're right that I, I, I did have the advantage of growing up with parents that were not clock in, clock out parents and that I did, I think, even if it was unconsciously figure out if I wanted to have a career, I was going to have to figure it out on my own because nobody was going to do it for me because my parents definitely were not. There's also something interesting what you just said of that. So your parents weren't giving you necessarily that affirmation on your career wasn't something shared. 
which God, I, I mean, I think about the times that my parents are proud of me and let me know. And I, I've definitely gotten that. It makes me feel really good. Yeah. The flip side is I wonder if on some level we're, anyone who ever got that from their parents is always kind of looking for some level of approval mm. whether it's specifically from mom and dad i need to like do this work for them to respect the career that i have mm-hmm. or just that i look to people for approval at all mm. and like i can understand in some ways that might be really moments might be tough of that yeah but at the same time i wonder if there's a freedom and like well i'm doing it for me because I mean, I'm, it... I'm not going to get that approval from anyone else right and and, and i'd say in the Every time I work with you, it never seems like you want feedback, you know, if you're in a class, constructive criticism, but there's, it's not like you're living and dying by the feedback mm. where other people, I think their entire month might be ruined by one bad run in an acting class. Right, right. And it's like, okay, well, I saw it different. Yeah. Let's try it this way then. Cool. I mean, it, I think it's, you're so right. I mean, I don't know. It's hard to, to like look at myself that way, but I do know that it has caused me a lot of pain. I think it has, it's, it's hard to work so hard. Like, it's so nice when you say like, you look, you know, I look at you, Leah, and you've always been this person that just does it yourself. And I go, no, I am that person. And I wish my dad or my mom could see how hard I work and like how much I have done. And that can be tough to, to, to feel like you go home to San Francisco and they're like, oh, poor Leah. <laughs> like, Apparently, how are the you're a prostitute on Hollywood and Vine going. It's like, what an interesting <laughs> corner for that too. Like, right? have you been? That's the Pantages. Like, <laughs> that's some fancy blowjobs to like gray hairs taking their grandkids to see Wicked for the sixth right. time. Right. It's Here's like Lee on her corner. <laughs> it's like I think you mean a certain part of like downtown, right. or like I don't think you mean Hollywood and Vine. Isn't that where that like Irish bar's been for a long right. time? It always right. seems really really friendly yeah, around there. New corner. I don't think the, the Scientologist part of on town Third is Third Street and. I don't I don't know. I'll find something. You'll find your blowjob yeah, corner. I'll find my blowjob corner more realistic. <laughs> um, so talk to me about how... Okay, so you create Destroy the Alpha Gammas. I created... I, it was literally supposed to be a vehicle for me and my and my abilities. And, and instead it, it got me doing, married. And instead it got Brian Norris married. Thank I mean, you. but but it was a lot of beautiful things came out of that. Yes. Uh, inclu- not just your marriage, but also... Like, no, just that. Just, just that's that, it. actually. It, it failed. It failed greatly and we're all broke. <laughs> the and creative part is over, but I won. fired off the I following. Won. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Shin. Um, no, it actually... It set me on this path. I was winning a lot of awards and I was doing the, this, the, uh, the festival circuit, which I had never done. And then every place I would pick up an award, whether it was like, you know, best musical or best editing or best. Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, whoa, this is actually really like lovely and validating. And I feel really seen by this. And I feel a lot of power from this. And that's new. Because I just like lost my record deal. My whole life was destroyed and nobody would even let me in for this audition. I couldn't get an agent. And then all of a sudden it was like people were knocking. And then I got reps. And before you knew it, I had some pitch opportunities and big producers calling. And it didn't end up getting sold and picked up by a a network. But what it did, and to be honest, I wasn't so heartbroken because the gift that it gave me was, oh, I can do this. Because the genesis of this was me, came from me, came from my idea, came from me pulling together people that I loved and that I wanted to work with, or people that believed in me that wanted to invest, or like whatever it was. And so I was already like ready for the next thing. And from there, I started doing short films. And one of those films was Girl in the Green Dress with Sarah. Um, Which I'll just say was really striking showing up on that set and get and seeing that script because uh look there's lots of wonderful short films there's tons of them to see one that your friends are doing that is a period piece um that includes modern dance numbers in an entirely different place it's dealing with issues of like sexuality and entirely different time. Like these are not easy things. We were talking, I was talking about with Patrick Cavanaugh about like advice to make a short film. And a lot mm-hmm. of it is like, well, what locations do you, how can you make it sure. as simple and cheap as possible? <laughs> right. And I still stand by that as where to start um, for the most part. Mm-hmm. But I would say in a lot of ways, you kind of defy that where it doesn't yeah. seem like we're starting with our limitations. It seems like we're saying, what kind of story do I want to tell? And let's 
we'll just make it happen. Sure. And I, and I, so Pat is like the king of that. And I agree with that advice a hundred percent. I had grown to that point a little bit where DAG was supposedly starting with our limitations. Little did I know we're going to be like these huge musical numbers with like 20 dancers. I thought that was within my limitations, but, um, and then, and I have made many films that way, but Girl in the Green Dress was sort of my, my aunt, who was one of the great loves of my life, who loved me so much, passed away and left me a little bit of money. And what was I going to do? She loved dance so much, but like, I was going to make something, you know, that honored her and also was she she was investing in me, you know, and 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 um, Sarah and I had the idea and um, we wrote it together and we figured, yeah, we don't have a lot of money, but we have a lot of people that we know and we have a lot. We're good at asking for things we have no business asking for. Um, And so that up to that point was my biggest like production in, in a sense because he, Dag was probably bigger as far as like size. That's but destroy this, the alpha gamma, right? right? Right, but um, Girl in the Green Dress was, um, yeah, it was a period piece and and it had dance and it. It's when you do something in the fifties. I mean, everything down to your, the way that your hair is styled to the, the style of the phone. It's being pulled from a warehouse because if you want to get it right, and we did, um, so. So yeah, we put a lot in. That was a that was a new experience for us. So how do you go from short films, mm-hmm. which quite an undertaking to begin with, for sure, to a feature? That was the big jump, right? That was the big leap, and I felt that I was ready because I had done this like seven episode web series. I had done I think five or six shorts that had, had that had played festivals, and I had done all that, and I had written this feature film, and I thought. Well, it takes place mostly on a college campus. I'll get Chapman to hook me up because they have they had had my back and my mentor JB, who I spoke about, stayed. I stayed very close and still am very close, and he always had my back. And so, and he had become the chair of the College of Performing Arts. So, like, I was like, this is going to work out for me. <laughs> so, what I did, my first step, which I'm proud of, and I always recommend this to other um, filmmakers. You ask everybody to coffee that has done it. Anybody that you know that has made a feature film and it has done well, you go and you ask them to coffee. And you just, you and you pay for coffee. <laughs> you say, can I take you to coffee or can I take you to lunch or whatever it is. I just have a lot of questions. And one of the biggest questions that everybody always asks is, how do I finance it? Where am I going to get the money, right? And I thought I was going to make um, MFA for 100000 That was my goal. And actually, one of the, Another one of the things that I did was I was at festivals for Girl in the Green Dress. So I, while I was doing the festival circuit with Girl in the Green Dress, my eye was already on the next thing, which was financing MFA, getting that money, right? Did you already have the full screenplay by that point? Do you have a... Yes. I had completely written it. I'd been through several drafts collecting notes from my professor, collecting notes from Shin, con- my 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 boyfriend at the time who was a screenwriter and and also Shin had gotten me hooked up with Jess Prosser who was um, the uh, fact checker on Criminal Minds. So he was really helpful to me as far as like how do police departments work? How what are the cuz I, I remember writing it, it was like cop 1 speaks to cop 2 speaks to cop 3. And he's like no, that's the lieutenant. <laughs> like <laughs> It was all like Here's one a hierarchy. level cop. <laughs> I like didn't know any of that because I wasn't into like cop procedurals. Let me just stop for you for one second though. This is where this is the I think this is the special thing about you right here. Mm. Maybe that uh, that limits it, but this is a special thing. I know a ton of people who stop right there. Mm. I don't know how a cop. I don't know how precinct works. I don't know how right, police works. Right. So I'm going to watch ten cop movies, and after sure. that, or I need to go on a ride along, or I Ooh, like, right. And look, that all that been stuff. Smart. Is, well, all that stuff is great, but it's all stopping with this idea that someone's going to give me the answer. Right. And I like what you're doing, which is saying I'm going to keep going, and eventually, some I'll, I'll get. I'll to clean this up. Yeah. It'll get clean. Yeah. But uh, you know, I still remember writing papers in high school and college, and the hardest thing for me about it was. I needed it to be perfect a sentence at a time. It was really hard for me to be like, it just, it's a, okay, it's terrible right now. I'll go back and I'll fix it. Or if the introduction isn't right, how could I possibly, you know, other people would be like, well, I'm just going to write this paragraph first and I'll get to this part later. Mm. And that took me so many years mm-hmm. to be able to say, it's okay. 
it's okay. You'll come back to it. You'll trust it. Yeah, yeah. I do think that that's a special thing that is a skill that often needs to be learned, the trust. And like, I'll get back to it later. And and who cares if someone looks at it and says, you don't know how cops are. <laughs> right. Well, I think a lot of people, if they're trying to write a movie about cops, Sure. That includes some cops. And mm-hmm. then someone, and if anyone looked at you and said, you don't know cops, then I instantly had turtle up about the whole mm. fucking thing. And I right. think that there is a, there is a bravery and like, um, and almost like blinders on sometimes. Full on so blinders. A hundred percent. Which I admire greatly. Oh, I think it takes you. a lot of courage to do that. I do. Because oftentimes it's vulnerable to say, yeah, I read a movie. I don't know how cops talk yet. Right. You'll help me. I think I think the other side of that is that it, it could be considered lazy. But I think for me, it wasn't that I was lazy. I just knew what my story was. And the the levels of cops and like the precinct, like that was, that, that will be figured out, like you said, because that is not what matters. What matters is like the human story that's happening. And that is what I had clear, clearly in my head. So where did MFA come from? What was the idea? What was the genesis of an idea? What was the seed? Um, I, you know, I've been asked this question so many times and I wish I could remember the exact moment that it came to me. Um, but I was, I know that it was probably like starting to percolate. Is that a word? Mm-hmm percolate in my mind that for some reason when it said, was said out loud it didn't sound like a real no, word. No, I think it's actually like right on. I think it's a high dollar <laughs> word right there that's exactly correct. Okay, good. Yeah, but you got most of your change back on that by asking afterwards. <laughs> no. It's like that five dollar word now it's 50 cents. That's fine. But I think it started because I like all of this it felt like deja vu every day there was a new case of a girl being raped at a university in the United States and the school turns out the girl killed herself and she was raped oops or the girl was raped and now she's been bullied and she has dropped out of school or the girl was raped and she reported it and then the the guy the, the school gave the guy a slap on the wrist and then he raped another girl and it was just like every day it felt like these same stories were coming out and I was like how is this possible that nothing is happening and nothing is changing and I think coming from a place of rage was the idea I'm gonna write a movie about a art student who is lacking inspiration and lacking her idea for her thesis and is raped. And we see how that affects her and how that changes her and how that kills a part of her. And then she starts murdering all of the campus rapists in response and incorporating them into her art. And that was sort of the idea, right? And I think when you hear that, I'm like, wow, that's pretty violent. I think it was coming from a place of violence within me, right, of just this anger. And people always ask me, which is like a semi-inappropriate question, but I welcome it. They always ask me if I was raped. And my response to that is always like Amy Schumer has this joke of like, ladies, we've all been a little raped, which is like so dark, but so true. And I have had a lot of creepy things happen to me, whether I when I was at school or mostly being in the industry, things that have happened to me as an actress at and, Hollywood as, and, and singer at Hollywood, and <laughs> not getting paid for it. <laughs> and I think that that. So I think that and any girl can relate to that sort of violence and that, you know, the darkness of sexuality and, and sexual experiences at times. Um, so I wrote the film and, and, and the first draft was like so dark. It was like so, so dark. And my professor at Chapman was one of the first people to read it. And he goes, this is great. I love it. It's very dark. What if it was like Django Unchained and it felt good? when she kills these guys and there's an element of fantasy and there's an element of humor and there's an element of like um you know uh uh what is that word what it means catharsis yeah catharsis and I went oh yeah that's a good no and so from there the draft started we started having those like one-liners and a bit more of the um tongue-in-cheek and doesn't that put more of the power in your lead's hands also too because if it's if it's if it's all dark then it seems like, oh, they've made me do this and there might be still some empowerment in, in writing a wrong. But that doesn't seem as, pa- like, you know who gets one-liners? Fucking Dirty Harry gets totally, one-liners. Totally. You know, like protagonists. 100%. People who are in charge of a story. Yes. right. And I think that that was illuminating and that was like sort of this aha moment for me and I went, what a great note. Um, but I think the first draft was so dark because I was so pissed and I was so, and being somebody that loves women and loves Um, the female experience for all that it means and and grew up fascinated by what it means to be a woman and I read 
every magazine since I was like seven years old, eight years old. I had a, a subscription to all the magazines and I'd be coming asking my dad for more money. And he'd be like, not from more <laughs> subscriptions. Like you, like magazine shows up every day. But I was very fascinated by anorexia and bulimia and rape and, um, y- y- you know, No STDs wonder your parents were scared. They were so scared for me, but I was so fascinated by like what it meant to be a teenage girl, but I wasn't a teenage girl yet, you know, to have a crush and to like, you know, what it means to lose your virginity, like all of these things surrounding, you know, the female experience. So I think when it came to rape, that was always something that affected me. I wonder how many people's first screenplays are driven by anger. Mm. Because anger, like sadness makes you depressed. Sadness can ground you to something and it can be tough to do anything with Mm. it. Anger changes things. Yeah, it's fiery. It's light under your ass. It's not quiet usually. Yeah. Even quiet anger explodes eventually. So there's something forward propulsion about that. And I just, I wonder if like maybe, it sounds like what you have is really healthy curiosity. Mm-hmm. Like you're interested in a sure. lot of things. Your brain, your your the artist inside you will get turned on by ideas probably pretty quickly. And then you actually have something to say about it. And then from there, start getting creative. Right. But I feel like those are some really good ingredients if people are thinking like, well, what is my idea? Where do I start? Like, what the fuck pisses you off? Right. What do you care sure. about? Like if you could what scream you something from the mountaintops, start there. There's this quote that really kind of, I think, encapsulates my view on writing, and it is, and I wish I knew who said it. I'm so embarrassed. I should probably Google who said it. Can we Google it so that I don't look like an asshole? Um, It's write a true sentence. Write the truest sentence that you know. And that always, like, has stuck with me because if it is true and authentic to you, I promise you people will relate to it. People relate to what it is to be human, and it doesn't need to – you could be a kid from Zimbabwe and feel that your story does not transfer and translate to everybody, but it will if it is authentic to you because everybody understands anger and isolation and loneliness. And these are, we all understand more about each other than we think. And I think that what you said is my strength as a creator is my blinders that I don't stop to think if this is going to translate or if this is going to work well or if it's going to sell or if it's going I don't think about that stuff I just do well it sounds like you got the right methodology because those blinders don't work if you don't ever get the feedback but it sounds like you have a couple you have like the circle of people who you trust who are good at feedback who understand you so you can you can afford those blinders because eventually you'll come back around to anything you might have missed yeah for sure yeah, there's, you know, it's funny doing this. You, you start to realize that everyone's story is unique, but it, there's certain ingredients mm. that a lot of people have. And some of them are, one of them is this ability of just like narrow focus on the goal mixed with some kind of champion that comes in a lot of different places. Sometimes yeah. it's, sometimes it's a lover, sometimes it's a teacher, sometimes it's a, a casting director that says you. Yeah. Um, but it's kind of you putting in the work and you having that singular focus and then someone else saying like, this this person's doing it. I'm going to take them out of this pond and put them and into put the them better the one leads. or the bigger yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting seeing like the things that do kind of overlap. So MFA, uh, what are a couple of things that you wish you had known before that that you didn't, that you learned doing it? Oh, man. I mean, that was a that was a rough one for me. It was really rough, and I'm grateful that people have responded to it because it was not a like enjoyable experience. Making the film was really hard. And can you share any yeah, bit of why? Like, I don't want to pry totally. too much. But I mean, it. it uh, but I'm gonna pry. <laughs> no, please. I think I wish that people told me some of these things. You know, because like I said, where I started with going and 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 asking everybody, how did how do I finance a film and. The, be- the great advice that everybody gave me was you go and you tell every single person that you know that you're making a movie. Do you know anybody that might be interested in financing and fi- in, in, um, investing in film? And he, this, somebody said to me, you might not know people with money to be spent on film, but you know people that know people with money to be spent on film. And film is a sexy thing to invest in. It might not be the most reliable. It's definitely not the most reliable. It's definitely a gamble. Did those investors make any money back? Yeah, they actually were like close to breaking, like paying everybody back. We're like getting there. We're like inching it. Because here's what you don't really, here's one thing I wish I knew. You can sell the movie for more than you made it for. 
a big chunk is going to your sales team. Certain territories don't pay you. Then they then your your um, sales team has to turn around and sue them. But now the film has been on the market for a year. It's probably being pirated. They can give you back your film, but you just lost your year. And someone's on the hook for the legal fees to sue those people. Completely. I mean, there's and 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 I was like, how, we sold my film for more than it was made. How is it possible that we are still just getting these checks that are like? inching it do you know what I mean and I'm like wow I guess I wish so that's one thing I think just to know is like keep your costs so low if you can make your film for a million dollars why are you making your film for a million dollars unless Emma Stone and Jeff Bridges are in it like make your film for a hundred thousand dollars make your film for two make your film for not a dollar more than you need because you have to you, if you make a film for $500,000 and it sells for $500,000, that is a big amount that you sold it for. That is like very rare that that's happening. And my film premiered at South by Southwest, like in competition. Like we had a pretty good start and we sold the film, but like it did not sell for $500,000 in the United States. So luckily I didn't make my film for $500,000. I made it for way less than that. But your film is considered a failure if you didn't recoup that money. But if you made your film for 50000 and sold it for 500000 like, you just killed it. So where are the ways to keep costs down I from think, someone who's done it? I think you need to cut down on those locations. Like, I, what was I thinking with 8 million characters? What was I thinking with the police precinct? <laughs> like, what, what was I Back thinking? Back to the police again. What was that shit? And somebody brought this up, which was, like, so smart, and I didn't realize. It's like, we, as an, as an audience, as a country, have a very, we are used to seeing Criminal Minds and Hawaii Five O and all of CSI, all these really glossy um, interpretations of what a, it is to be a policeman or, and, and what those precincts look like. And it's, like, all touch screens. I, and did, like. I did an episode <laughs> of SWAT, and when I saw what their command center oh, no. looked like. I mean, what did it look like? I mean, amazing for them. It makes good TV. It looks right. like my Minority Report. It looks like Minority Report. I mean, report. it's the it's exactly. more expensive than every Apple store put together. 100%. Yeah. Right? Everything's a touch screen. Everyone's yeah. like got these amazing Under Armour shirts on and like yeah. tactical vests and all this stuff. And totally. It's just, and how are you supposed to compete with that with your little tiny indie film? So I had a smart director that was like, how about we put this outside of the building? How about we make this a walk and talk through the neighborhood? Genius. Just, you know, ideas like that. And because here's my university, because we have to shoot at Chapman because we can't be moving all over the place. So they're like, here's your, like, you know, classroom that you have to turn into a police precinct. (laughs) And I'm like, oh, shit. And my art department is like, yeah, no, that's not going to work. So, you know, all of these things I'm just trying to – and actually, we actually did do reshoots in an actual police station, which was amazing. But, like, that was because one of our girls, her dad was a police officer and came and helped out on the film. Like, that doesn't happen. Do you know what I mean? So, And they don't usually let you shoot inside a police department. So, I mean – be smart about how many locations you have. Be smart about how many actors you actually need. Like, that's why I get so jealous and so, like, I'm applauding them constantly, these filmmakers that make these, like, incredible one-location films. Like, The Invitation, did you see that movie? I haven't yet. Oh, it's so dope. It's a handful of actors. It's a dinner party that goes very, very, very wrong. And it's a horror film. And it's awesome. And it's very tense. And I just wa- I was just watching it, and I was like, these – they're incredible. You know, why didn't I think of that? Or this other movie um, called um, um, uh, Always Shine. And it's li- I, I was kicking myself going, if anybody could have come up with this, it was, it was me. We and I didn't come with, up with, with it. With Kavanaugh earlier, that, that uh, Tarantino's first directorial movie is Reservoir Dogs. That is two sets. Right. Uh, Christopher Nolan's first movie, The Following, is all outside and one apartment dressed four different ways. And Brilliant. And just like, make it something that could have been on stage. Totally. And then shoot it really interesting. Exactly. Like, uh... I love watching Mindhunter, the fr- like uh, mm. the David Fincher show mm-hmm. on Netflix. I haven't seen it yet. Everybody's telling me. Check it out. Uh, what's so cool, I think, I mean, the whole show is good, but the episodes he directs are on a different level. And there'll be these scenes that are 12 minutes long in one room. Wow. And you will not really have realized it. Wow. And the amount of tension he's able to get. And all of a sudden, like, your angles start getting real interesting. Mm. And the way you're visually telling that story gets way more creative than if you had 20 different sets. Because then you're just going to get your master and your coverage you're going to call it a day. Yeah. But all of a sudden you get people getting real creative in that. And right. that all of a sudden gives you a visual style that someone later is going to say, well, that's your style. Where'd you come up with that? And so that's how we had to shoot it. Right. Okay. So MFA, 
we've learned uh, some stuff about financing, keeping our costs down, trying to keep the location and character numbers down if yep. we can. Yep. Um, can I move on or any other final lessons from that that you want to share? Ask lots of people for help. You know what I would say my biggest thing probably of anything is as a writer, you really need to let go of your vision as soon as you're shooting. I mean, it's like maintain your dream and your goal and your North Stars for your characters and your story and all of that, but let go of what you have in your head because the truth is this. It is no longer in your hands. It is in the hands of many people, especially your director. And if you're directing it, great. But if you have handed it off to a director, they need space to be able to create. They they have their own interpretation. And I think so much was caused me so much pain when things would go wrong. And things are always going wrong. Things are changing. It is a, a living organism that's trying to find its way. And I think I was so because this was my first big thing my first feature film and I had and another thing was like as an actress I was always the star of my other stuff this was my first time handing off the leading role to a different actress to Francesca Eastwood who's very brilliant and 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 just very naturally talented but that was hard and it was hard to see things changing before my eyes or to have to leave to put out a fire and then to come back and see that that what was being made was different from what was in my head and it caused me so much pain that I wish I could have sat myself down before shooting and gone Leah I know that you have worked your ass off to get this written to get this finance to hire everybody here I know that you are like so stressed out and like clinging to this for dear life but you need to chill out and like you need to make space for everybody to collaborate. Otherwise, you're just going to cause yourself more pain than it needs to be because it is different and that's the reality. And e- even the process of editing it, cutting my own favorite scenes because it was three hours long and once we put it all together and nobody, I, am I Christopher Nolan? No, nobody wants to see a three-hour movie from me. So, so it was like get over yourself and get over whatever. I mean, my entire B story was cut. Wow. And that was like death to me. It was like a loved one dying. I mean, I cried and cried and cried and cried. And it was like, now I look back and I feel so sorry for, my, for myself because it was when you work so hard for something and it's your baby and you see it changing and you see what feels like it falling apart, it's just like I have nothing else. I have to move home to San Francisco and do real estate with my dad because I'm not like cut out for this because I just like shat the bed and like everything that I have done has led to this point and I just like failed. It's a lot on you. It was. It was a lot. It was like the darkest time of my life. How long did it take for you to get out of it? You know, I have to say, and it was like so emotional for me to meet um, Janet and Jared, the programmers of South by Southwest. And I told them this and it was like, they they were so sweet about it, but I was not exaggerating. Like they literally like kept me from making some big change that might have led me to I don't want to say quit the business, but like might have led me to leaving for a while or something because I was in so much pain over the process. And we got into South by before the film was done. So we submitted a, a, a unfinished cut and then we found out that we were premiering like in competition. And then it was like, you can't stay crying when you have work to do, nope. you know? So from there, it was like every day editing, music, sound, blah, 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 all of this rushing, rushing, rushing to get it done in time. And it, I'm telling you, I think it was like the universe going, like you're not leaving, Leah. Like we're gonna you got force work to do. you to stay here and to get back at it. And if I hadn't gotten into South by, and I'd had those several months to just sort of like reflect, it was dark. You know, it was dark. And so, but you also can't stay in that dark place when such wonderful things are happening. And there were several companies that wanted to buy the film, and there were several offers, and there was. And then before you knew it, my agency was like, it's time for your literary agent. You're joining the literary department. I was like, oh, really? Okay. And then I'm meeting every – it was like this whirlwind happened. And MFA like literally gave me a career. And it was this new phase of my life and this new phase of my career. And I think there was a big part of me that was just so hurt about what I had been through as an artist and the death of what I originally envisioned. And it was like I wasn't able to completely – experienced the joy of I did this thing with this team and it is doing well and Leah get over it because people are liking it whether or not it's what you originally envisioned get over it 
And I wish if I could give any advice to screenwriters out there, or actors turned screenwriters, or anybody that's setting out to make their, even if it's a short film, see that it's a living, breathing thing that's bigger than you once it has hit the page and embrace changes because best idea wins and your idea might not be the best idea. So what works on a page isn't always what works in real life. And totally. sometimes it's the essence of what you're getting yes. after on the page. I was just shooting this scene for a show and the whole, the whole bit was that this guy, no, uh, this woman was really trying to get something for my character who's this guy who just works at a desk somewhere and doesn't want to give it. And in the script, she's trying like eight tactics and it literally says he just reads, mm. turns the page turns a page and on a page that works mm. on a page that idea makes sense of oh mm -hmm. it's like this obstacle doesn't give a shit that doesn't happen in real life right. no one goes up to somebody and starts talking to them and they just turn pages and right. act like you're, you're not there there's yeah. some there's some obstacle that's happening there's we've all met walls of people but the interaction was true on the page for the idea, but it wasn't true for human behavior. Mm. And then in that moment, the director's got to make a scene work. Yes. And yes. then it's like, okay, great. How can we find behavior that keeps you stonewalling her where it doesn't look like you might be deaf? Right. Like, and just unaware that yeah, there's totally. a human there. And we've got to figure out how to take the story off the page and actually hit the writer's intention, which might look a little bit differently than 100%. what the words look like. A hundred percent. And and I think that when you are so close to something and you have fought for something and you have spent so much time with something, you're so sure that your work is brilliant and that there's no better version out there. And the truth is, honey, this is your first fucking feature film. Your shit is not that brilliant. <laughs> like, exactly. It's not that fucking good. Like, sorry, Leah, from two years ago, three years ago, whatever it was, like, your shit was not that great back then. It was the best that you could do at that point. It was, and I get that you gave your all to this, but there are better versions of this. So get over it and like be so grateful for the fact that you have worked hard enough that the movie is getting made and that now it's going to South by Southwest. And it was fucking great, by the Thank way. Thank you. I remember that premiere. That was really, really, it was like, oh my God, my friend fucking did this. Uh -huh. Like, the, yeah, I mean, you sometimes see a movie and you're like, oh, you made a movie. And it's like we all kind of got together and watched. And then you see something like, oh, you made a movie, like capital M movie that like yeah. you could go and see. And it just, I don't know, I was incredibly impressed. Thank you. So what happened after that? So we had the dark period. The dark period. You get this movie delivered. Yes. Um, you sell it. We sell the movie. It's successful in that regard, right? So here's the kind of crazy part that I don't talk about too often just because I don't want to like out her or whatever. But... The truth is, what happens is you get reps in the lit in the literary world, which was not something that I had ever like it, it, attempted. Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't something. It's so funny when you talked about other actors that are like they feel that you feel that they they think that they are working for their agents, right? And I. It's almost like I never believed in that. I never believed that there was going to be this magical producer or this magical agent that was going to come along and like make my career happen. And I don't know if that's something I learned in a past life. I don't know if that's accumulation of all of the times that I felt that an agent just didn't get me out or like. I don't think it's about that. My gut is that you felt like your response, like you know that you can create work and that you can make your dreams come true or that at least it's on your shoulders. I think that other people don't know how to do it themselves and so they have to put it on the agent. Mm. And then also the agent has to tell me how to do it because I don't know how to sure, do that. Sure, sure. And so it actually ends up being kind of the surrogate for someone tell me how to be a self-starter. How to, how to do this, right. Right, well I mean, I didn't even understand what it meant to have a literary agent. I didn't know what their job was. I didn't know what I, my job was. All I knew was that I made a movie it premiered at South by, we sold it, thank God, I'm still reeling from the experience and sort of like don't know up from down and all I'm like dying for is a fucking vacation. Like I just Did need... you get that vacation? You ready? It's coming. It's coming? It's, it hasn't no, happened No, it's yet? coming oh, in the story. Okay. So I, luckily by a stroke of brilliance that is the world, I booked a, my first recurring, it was supposed to be a guest star, and then I wrote a note to the showrunner and I said, thank you for writing like this powerful female role. It's like so refreshing to have a man that can write women so in such a cool way. And like How'd you get that note to them? I, I wrote it and I gave it to him on my last day of shooting. Great. It was a card. 
it's sort of my tradition. I love cards. I collect them, and I and I love to write letters. Um, so I do that for for actors that I had like a lot of time with on a film, and the director usually, the casting director, if I'm close to them. Um, and I said, if you have, if you run out of ideas, I've got an idea. Bring my character back. <laughs> and I get a call like a week or two later saying, you've been written into the season. You're coming back. And I was b- being made essentially like a series regular, but it was the season finale. So if it had been renewed, I would have been like one of the major roles, but it did not get renewed. But I had gotten, so I got this recurring and had a little bit of money, which was weird because I had invested all of my own money into MFA and didn't even have any money for rent, which was so stupid. But I put everything into my movie, so I was like broke. Book this recurring role, have a little bit of money, and I go, I'm going to Europe. I'm going alone. I need to get out of here. Like I am so like... I don't even know what I've been through the past six months from the process of like wrapping my film to finishing my film to going to South by, you know, I had to publish this out South by, I was like, like every single year, you know, you're promoting the film, you're doing press. I mean, it was like a whirlwind. Then they're like, here's your literary agent. And then you're at the water bottle, on the water bottle tour where you're at every single production company in Los Angeles. You're like at Steven Spielberg and Reese Witherspoon's, you're at Annapurna and you're like, this is really cool. I know that this is cool, but like, I don't really know what I'm supposed to say. Like, nobody, like, prepped me. And so I would, like, I remember finishing my first general, and they were, like, so great. So, like, we're such a fan of yours, so, like, let's stay in contact. And then I was, like, wait, are you going to, like, hire me on something? Like, <laughs> are you going to hire me today? Like, Are you my boss now? Are you my boss? <laughs> like, what am I, I doing here? I feel like it's here? that little kid's book, Are You My Mother? It's 100% Are You My... That is so what it is. <laughs> Home run. Thank you. Home run. <laughs> Thank you. If I can get every podcast to oh eventually tie back to a children's book, that's, that is so that's my legit, new though. thing. That's it's what I do. so real. Are you my mother? That's where I was. So Reese Witherspoon, are you my mom? All, yes. All around Hollywood and everybody's going, no, I'm not your mother. Get and out your of our office. therapist mother is like, I'm supposed <laughs> I'm to be your, your mom. Let me make you my child. Stop giving blowjobs <laughs> in Hollywood and come home. I have to leave. You know my whole life story. That's the end. That's you like it. totally get it. And it's over. That's it. That's the end of the podcast. Wait, who's your mom now? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go ask people at Hollywood and find oh, if no. they're my mother. Oh, God. We're really mixing some <laughs> stories now. Oh man. Okay, so we, you go to Europe. <laughs> so so I'm water bottle tour. Don't know what the fuck that was. Last day before I go to Europe, I meet at a company that is a part of the Weinstein company. Oh. And I meet this girl, Becky, Becky Sanderben. And we she's my same age and we just like hit it off. She was a fan of MFA. She's a fan of my work. And we just hit it off. And I was there for like two hours. And I just like loved this girl. And and everybody that I had met so far had been lovely and very smart and wonderful to me. But this girl, I just had this like instantaneous connection with. And she pitches me this idea, which by the way, nobody had really done up until that point. Like they were kind of like, pitch us your ideas. And I'm in a place where I'm like, I don't even know if I still want to be a writer. I kind of want to go to Spain and like find a husband. Like I don't <laughs> even know like what y'all want from me. Like I just made a fucking movie and now you want me to pitch all this new shit? Like I just need to like breathe for a second. So I'm just like, get me out of here. She pitches me this idea. It's a blog. It's based on a true story about a woman who married her high school sweetheart. He was like Mr. Perfect. He, They had the dog, the two beautiful children. He was the dad that organized the weekly poker match with the dads and the morning carpools. He was just like the dude. Went for a walk and shot himself in the head. Oh, Jesus. No note, no bankruptcy, no marriage problems. I mean, it was like completely out of nowhere. And it like completely shook this community of like if he could kill himself any of us could kill themselves like how is this possible like the modern version of the virgin suicide a little bit i recently saw that movie again yeah god that book is so good too i haven't read the book it's it's upsetting but like yeah that whole thing of that family supposed to be perfect right we don't get it because they're all so beautiful they're so lovely yeah it it is a bit like that right Mm -hmm. and this woman um, Cheryl, sh- the wife, she kept a blog called What the Fuck Glenn. And it's this really dark but really funny sort of reflection and meditation on what it is to all of a sudden be a single mother, to have all of these questions, to be single in your 40s when you married your high school sweetheart. And it's just what what is up and what is down. And I felt like immediately I had this sort of like kinship to her because I felt that way, even though 
I mean, I had been through a long relationship with with the love of my life for five years where we lived together. We broke up. I went straight into making MFA. I was just, an MFA was just the most painful, difficult experience, probably because of the fact that I wasn't dealing with the emotional pain that I was having from my breakup. And it had become so important that if anything went wrong, it felt like this personal attack on me. And here I was just running to Europe because I was like, everybody leave me alone. I don't even know who I am. And here was this woman like continuing to show up and go to Soul Cycle in the mornings and continuing to try to figure out and try to try to you know like love him while hate him and be angry at him and I mean it was just fascinating to me and I said let me read the blog and I went to Europe alone and I read the blog on trains and I just was like I love this woman and I think I get this woman and I want to do this because she wanted to make it into a television show. Keep in mind, I have no experience in television. I've made nothing but a, I mean, I made my web series and I've made my short films and then I, I've acted in television, yeah. but I've never written that. And I don't know what I'm doing, but I just was like, I want this. I come back. The week that I get back is the week the MFA is premiering nationwide in theaters. And it's the week of the Weinstein scandal. Oh. So my reps are like, you're not working on that because Weinstein... They own it. Is going down. And they own that blog. And so the actual, like the rights holders of the blog removed it, took it off, took it off on their own, okay. which makes perfect sense. You know, I am swept up in MFA and releasing that and press and all of this. And it, it actually worked well for us because my film suddenly felt so relevant with all of the Me Too movement being restarted and I mean being jump started and <clears throat> and uh, so I you know lost that project it was swept up into the stratosphere and I start you know doing other things and and starting to okay get back in this going on eight million meetings what do I want to do what what speaks to me what it, what am I trying to say now that I'm starting to heal you know now that MFA is starting to have a life of its own it doesn't need me anymore um, and I did feel sort of renewed from my trip to Europe alone and having that like break um, <clears throat> and then uh, a lot has happened but that project ended up coming back around and Becky landed at Escape Artist which is this great company. Um, they do all the Denzel movies like Equalizer. They did Fences. Awesome. And just like an incredible company. And she was like, I want this project back. And so both of us ended up having to kind of fight for it. And she really believed that I was the writer, which was interesting because I don't even know if I really believed that I was the writer. I just knew that I loved it. I just knew that I loved this woman and I loved this story. And I'm so grateful that Becky believed in me enough to, to the rights holders push for me and to escape artists to push for me. And I ended up getting it and specking it. And then we, it, through many pitches and lo long process, Leslie Mann is going to star in it. And we set it up at HBO Max, which is the Warner's new streaming service. So Holy I know fucking it's, Isn't that cow. crazy? That is so exciting. I do, so I do feel like... And then I, ha you know, I wrote a movie while I was frustrated with other stuff, and so that got picked up by Sony, and so now I'm in rewrites for that, and Haley Steinfeld is gonna is gonna um, star in that. So now I feel like very much you can mark the point of my success to a making MFA because that was what got me into the studio system where people even knew who the hell I was because honestly nobody knew who I was and nobody was reading any of my shit or cared what I had to say and then all of a sudden you get a little bit of notoriety because you're in the indie world and they're kind of like oh who's this indie kid you start meeting everybody but I really do think that it was more than anything it was Becky really getting me and seeing my sense of humor and that it's dark and seeing that I am I'm young and ready and hungry but pretty specific in the kind of stories that I'm trying to tell which are very female driven um, very you know sort of walking the line between humor and darkness at all times and she just really gets me and so my Sony film was is also an escape artist project and and they have the first look with um, Sony so Sony picked it up and we have several other 
projects in the works and so it's really it's a it's a really like wonderful time because now it's like it's nice to not have to struggle to pay my rent like hey. to be totally honest like that's probably the biggest change more than anything is like to be finally in a place where I can like <gasps> breathe where I'm like oh my god it's not as as like paycheck to paycheck like it once was and I think that could cause us so such a sense of like um, instability in this world you don't realize how much it affects you until you're not ha handling that whole area of like worries anymore and you're like oh wow I can just like spend my days creating and like what do I have to say and that's and then you have other problems which is like getting out of bed when nobody's waiting for you yeah. <laughs> which is what I'm dealing with nowadays <laughs> so that's some really exciting stuff um I do want to ask, we're, we're nearing the end. I don't want to take too much of your time. No, um, no, I want to ask. I, I talked ask, really long about some other stuff, so you can cut out whatever if you want to keep You're talking. doing great. <laughs> it's so funny. Every single person is like, if you want to cut anything, I'm saying, I'm like, yeah, I brought you in to free. speak. <laughs> like, just get rid of the whole thing. Just keep your stuff. Yeah. Just keep your stuff. Um, sure, it's going to be such a weird podcast. We just edit together my questions. <laughs> do it. Um, the, some of these references won't make any sense after no? that. No? Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Keep the jokes. Keep make the jokes. Sure That's can, it. Yeah. This, blow you're, you're just blow jobs in Hollywood and Vine. It's going to be such a weird podcast <laughs> at that point. Um, okay, a couple things. When you're creatively stuck, what do you do? Honestly, the other day I had a glass of rosé, and that helped me a lot. But one. <laughs> or a whole bottle. I only had one. Hey, there you go. I, because I think sometimes creatively stuck is, is, is a broad term for being overwhelmed, for being tired, for feeling that you're going to be judged, for not knowing what a character does from here, for not having really properly envisioned the entire story. It could be so many things. And sometimes if you just get out of your own way, it's there and you just need to chill out. So like for me, I think sometimes like m take my laptop and go outside. Um, say, call it a day and go watch fucking Bachelor in Paradise and like take it easy on myself and say tomorrow I'm gonna get up early and I'm gonna be in a better place and like not being so hard on myself. So knowing when to just switch it up and also knowing when what we do as creatives is actually kind of spiritually draining and and I, you know, I always kind of relate myself to like a coal miner. I'm like, well, coal miners don't decide in the morning whether they want to go to work or not. They just like get up and go to work. And that's the way I should be. I should be disciplined. And then somebody was saying to me the other day, like, but you're not a coal miner. What you're doing, it takes a lot of like brain power and actually like vulnerability. And some days it's just not going to work out as well as other days. And that whole coal miner thing. So many people do that. For some reason, it's always <laughs> coal miners too. <laughs> Because what it's they like do we're is picking, so difficult. And it's like, yeah, yes. <laughs> but it's like, we're not. And right. that's, it's really, it's martyrdom, mm. which is like a really great way to hate yourself, mm -hmm. which will absolutely validate any of your doubts. And this idea that whatever writer's block, actor's block, creative block you have is mm -hmm. like, well, you deserve it mm -hmm. because you aren't taking advantage of your creative fucking lifestyle, yeah. living it up in Los Angeles. Sure. And like, I feel like guilt all the time, all the time, especially because I spent so many years doing day jobs, working at Chanel. I was a makeup artist and doing social media and all of the things to try to pay my rent. And that now my rent is finally paid. I feel angry at myself if I'm not capitalizing on it if I'm not getting up early and I'm not getting enough done because I'm like you have fought so hard for this moment why are you not taking advantage so I feel constant guilt and so I think I taking a page out of my mom's book I give myself mental health days which is like if if I'm sad or if I don't want to to talk to speak to that right now or if I don't feel like opening up my heart and my wounds right now then that's okay to take a day and, and, and I get inspired by people around me and things around me in the world all the time, all the time. Most of my inspiration, my inspiration for my Sony movie came from a stand-up show that I went to see Hillary in, my roommate. And it, it was just like funny and, and people were laughing and I had this, got this idea from sitting and watching the stand-up show. And that's how it happens. You can't stay home and think that you're going to be constantly inspired with new ideas. I think about the Sorkin 
describes says that like 80 percent of his writing process looks like him watching sports center in his underwear on the couch oh my god i love that and i have not heard that that makes me feel so much better about myself doesn't it mine is watching love island and bachelor in paradise oh, there you go um how has the the success and forward motion in your writing career affected your acting career i have less and less patience for auditions and roles that I don't want. I have all the patience in the world for the great stuff. All it's con that continuous forever, right? If it's in a great film with a great work or a great uh, filmmaker or a great role, I'm all in and I'm like I will make the time for that. But if it's like playing the same dumb girl or the same like token hot girl or whatever, the kind of stuff that I've done so many times, I'm like you know what I actually rather be at my at the wing with my laptop and my headphones on work creating work that I wanted that I want to see in the world well isn't that I mean I was like thinking of that as generous to the next wave of actresses who it's need true, that part true like you don't need that one right now mm -hmm. maybe someday you might and I bet and if you ever do you're gonna like that role more right. all of a sudden you're gonna be like oh no this gives me the chance to live my life the way I want to yeah and so it's fine but like right now you don't fucking need it I don't and it's so and I and I think you're so right because I do see myself as like being when I was younger and just like wanting to be on set and just like wanting to work and just like loving being on set and like I've realized over the years and p part of it might be my writing and part of it might just be being at it for as long as I have is like I don't love being on set if I don't love the work I'm making. I think that's one of the real secrets. That's like when I know somebody's been around for a little while is when they don't fetishize set. They fetishize yeah, their own, right. like, I'm telling this story that I love. Fetishize the hell out of that. Yes. I remember when I realized, I used to think that set was a place for actors. Mm. That like, oh, we're just going to go around, we're going to be playing, we're going to be exploring. <laughs> no, that's the cruise no. fucking yeah, home. totally. And they that's put you in a real. trailer, Just not to alone. like, they don't want to, like, they're not worried that you're like not rested. They want you in your cage. Yes. It's like, get you away get from us. You get lost all the time, totally. No, get out of the fucking way. Yes. It's, it's, you're in my home, I'm working <laughs> here. And you're just like, oh, where's Crafty? And what's <laughs> what's going to make me still look good <laughs> while know. I'm eating? And it's just like, <laughs> fuck so off. True. Um, it's so true. My, you know, my brother, he's a writer. He used to act for a long time. I remember he said, like, I don't like the audition carousel. I like mm. acting. Yes, But, like, right. this, is, this is not fun. It's and, not. And so many people are like, this is one of the funniest things to me. When people are like, I wish I had 10 auditions a day. Oh, whoa. Well, Careful what you wish for. Well, it's like, maybe. I don't. I want to be working all the time. Yep. But the idea of 10 auditions, like, mm -hmm. the idea that I'd be able to feel good about my work in all no of way. them. No way. Impossible. And, and like, there's there's no way I could give them all. And then like, I'd probably miss, you know, a whole week of experiences with friends or my wife right. or like all, all these different sure. things. Like your life disappears. I, I feel like we fetishize the wrong stuff. Like fetishize telling a story you love. Fetishize, right. you know, being around collaborative people who inspire you. Yeah. But, I mean, you don't, but here's the thing, Brian, you have worked a lot, right? You have worked a lot for a long time. You have a house. I mean, you have made it to a point, maybe not everybody on this podcast knows that, but I think that you have earned that privilege, right? To not have to fetishize I think that's fair. all of the auditions and, and all of the set time. And I have realized that you fetishize those things because that's you're fetishizing building a career and actually getting to do the thing. And so much of this career is spent in class or spent, you know, hoping for an audition or, or, or spent not getting the job, right? So like act, auditions are acting, you're acting, mm -hmm. you're getting to do the thing. And so I, I love young actors and I have so much like empathy for them because I go, they're just trying to work. They're just trying to do the thing. And once they have done much more of the thing, they will get to be, to decide what is the part of it, what are the parts that they love and that speak to them and that bring them alive. And for me, what I realize, what brings me alive are telling the stories that I believe in, not necessarily acting. Well, that is a great place to end. I hope that uh, sometime you might come back because yeah, I will find always. even more questions for you. Uh, Instagram? Leah McKendrick. There we go. Find her at Leah McKendrick. You can find us at, at Industry Town Podcast. And thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Thank you so much to Leah McKendrick, and thank you for listening. Please, if you like the show, please, please subscribe, give us a rating, and more than anything, please tell a friend. Follow us on all social media platforms at Industry Town Podcast. 
Thank you to our presenting sponsor, John Rosenfeld Studios. Industry Time will be back with a new episode on Monday. But until then, have a safe, happy weekend. And as always, go see a movie in a theater and maybe even tweet at me and tell me what you saw.